Excellent. Right, so before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that I'm presenting from, which in the ACT is the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So today I'll be talking about the one of the chapters of my PhD, which is on the phylogeny and biogeography of Australian and New Zealand longhorn beetles. So this family Serambicidae is one of the largest beetle families. It's got about 40,000 species worldwide, and all of them are wood feeders. So in some groups specialize on dead wood, and they form an important part of the ecosystem because they enable nutrient recycling. So the larvae are one of the first creatures to actually get into a dead log, and the tunnels that they form provide access for fungi and other microorganisms to get in and continue breaking it down. But on the flip side of that, there are other groups that attack living trees, and some of them are quite major economic pests, like the Asian longhorn beetle I've got pictured down there. Now, as you'd expect from such a large group, the systematics of longhorn beetles is difficult. So there's been decades of research using both morphological and molecular data, but the phylogenetic relationships are still unclear. It's especially bad at the tribal level, which sits between subfamily and genus. Now, there are a few reasons for this, but the main one is that the adult morphology is unreliable for establishing deep relationships. You can see you've got quite a variety of body shapes there. And the larvae, which are better at giving you an idea of the relationships are not available for every group. So based on this difficult morphological data set, we have conflicting classification systems that emerged in the, in the 19th century when people were describing longhorns independently and was never really fully reconciled these different systems. So there's a debate on how many subfamilies there are, but everyone agrees that the two largest are the Lemini and the Cerambicinae. They both have a worldwide distribution, but Australia is interesting in that we're the only place in the world where the Cerambicines are more species rich than the Lemmyines. And well, we're not really sure why. And now, since they're the largest subfamilies, their tribal classification is in a worse state than the rest. So for the Lemmyines, you can have anywhere between 60 to 90 tribes, depending on who you ask. So in a recent effort to address this, there was an excellent study done by a lab in Brazil. They used molecular data to look at the Lamiain tribes. They found quite a few of them were paraphyletic, some were actually monophyletic, but their sampling focus was on the type genera of the tribes, which as is the case of both things, is mostly in the Northern hemisphere. So the Australasian region was quite poorly represented in their study. One of the most important parts of the Australasian fauna is genus Rytifera. So it's the largest genus of longhorn beetles in Australia. It's about 200 species. They come in a variety of shapes and sizes, colors. They're found all over Australia. There are some other species in Southeast Asia, which is where we think they came from, but they're not as diverse there as they are here in Australia. So the reason why there's so many species in one group is that they used to be in 38 separate genera. These are all quite poorly defined morphologically, even by longhorn beetle standards. So they were recently revised and put into the one genus based on these hairy sex patches on the underside of the male abdomen. So we're treating this as the apomorphic trait, so the defining characteristic of the genus. But the boundary may not be that distinct. So we know there are similar structures in the sister genus Terolophia, and there are lots of other genera that are present in Asia that are not present in Australia that need to be examined. So my PhD was mostly focused on testing the monophyly of Rytifera using morphology and DNA from museum specimens. So the second part of that was to produce a subfamily level phylogeny, so I can see if the tribes hold up to molecular scrutiny, um, examine the biogeographic history of the Australasian fauna, and also just put Rytifera in a broader context, see where it came from. I talked about the first part of my project a couple of years ago, so today I'll be just talking about the biogeography 
chapter. So this was a collaboration with the McKenna Lab over the University of Memphis in the US. They developed the baits that I used. So thanks to them for their help. And if you're interested, this chapter is going to be published in the next volume of Systematic Entomology. So we had three hypotheses for this project. First one being that the tribes that are present in Australia, but have their type genus from Europe or America, we expect these to not be monophyletic. So that distribution just seems too broad to be realistic. Secondly, based on the relative diversity of the Lamiines and the Cerambicines in Australia, we expect that the Lamiines will be more recently derived from Asia, as opposed to having a Gondwanan origin. And finally, for Ritifera, I expect it to be closely related to Terralophia and Mesosa, which are genera with most of their species diversity in Asia. And we expected that at least a few Asian genera would share the sex batch trait with Ritifera. Right, so to get a phylogeny, I needed to get some sequence data. So this is a simplified workflow of anchored hybrid enrichment, which is a method for um, selectively sampling, well, sequencing genetic data from particular nuclear loci. So we start off with a beetle, extract the DNA, build up the library, and then we perform the target capture. So you have the particular bait sequences, so the little short bit in orange there. These correspond to the particular nuclear loci that we want to sequence. So they bind to the DNA from our beetle that matches them. We pull it all out with magnets and then amplify what we have. So we get a library that's enriched for our target loci. So then there's a whole bunch of computational stuff that I won't go into the details, but basically we take the raw sequencing reads and turn it into a nice clean alignment target loci to then use to estimate the phylogeny. I dated it with some fossil calibrations to get branch lengths in real time, and finally mapped the geography and morphology onto it. So this is the uh, undated tree to start with. So it's the first ever molecular phylogeny of Australasian Lamiines. So I was pretty excited to get this. Um, there's a lot going on here, so I'll, I'll step you through it. First up, we'll look at the left-hand side. So we've got the other subfamilies and uh, sort of our groups and stuff at the top. And then we have the Lamiines that are colored in here. So they're colored by tribe, which I've got the key down the bottom. Now I'll just draw your attention to this clade in the middle, clade B. This is where all the Australian and New Zealand endemic taxa are. And you can see this clade is a shambles. You've got tribes all over the place and they are sort of popping up in other parts of the tree outside of the clade B. So this is, um, agrees with our first hypothesis. So the Northern hemisphere tribes are not corresponding to the phylogenetic relationships within the Southern continent. So then I'll look at clade D. So I've expanded on the right side of the figure. This is where my genus Ritifera is. It is monophyletic, yay. And it's closely related to Terralophia, Mesosa, and a few other Asian taxa as well. So this clade was in better shape than the endemics. So we've got two subclades that pretty much correspond to two tribes. We've just got one genus here in orange that is out of place. That said, there are some other genera sitting right at the top, which are supposedly in the same tribe as Ritifera, but according to our phylogeny, probably should not be. Okay, so then I looked at the biogeography. So this is the dated tree now. It's sort of been flipped and trimmed compared to the other one. So we have one tip per genus. And the boxes there along the tips are the present day continental distribution. So you can see some genera are just in one place and some are quite widespread. And the pie charts at the nodes are the estimated ancestral areas. So this is, again, so our endemics clade is here in the middle. You've got Australia in yellow, New Zealand in red. And this dashed line is roughly when Australia split off from Antarctica and began drifting north towards Asia. 
So it's pretty obvious that our clade B predated that event. So our second hypothesis was not quite correct. So we can see that some of the taxa, uh, oops, <laughs> some of the taxa do seem to be derived from Asia. So we've got the green clade at the top, which is where Ratifera is, but the endemic taxa seem to have a Gondwanan origin. And interestingly, they're the only ones that have flightless species for our sampling. So I think that would make it difficult to get across the Tasman and colonize New Zealand, but there they are. Okay, so finally, for the morphology, I just looked at clay D, so Ritifera and its relatives. And it turns out that the sex patches are in almost every single genus within this clade. So the Mesocini tribe right down the bottom, they have sex patches on three ventrites, while the Terraplini, including Ritifera, just have the one set. The Ritifera itself is split in half. We've got clade one with hidden patches. So you can see there's, there's just this thick and fringe of hair and you can't really see anything underneath it. While clade two, most of the species have much larger, more easily visible patches. Okay, so to sum up, we found the vast majority of the Australasian endemic genera are in non monophyletic tribes. Contrary to our expectation, the Australian Lamiaine fauna are a mixture of Gondwan and Asian elements. And for Ritifera, we confirmed it has an Asian origin. It's related to Terralophia and Mesosa. It is monophyletic, but the sex patches are not more widespread than we previously thought. So I'd just like to thank everyone who helped with my PhD and thank you for listening. Thank you for the talk there, Lauren. Um, I'm sure everyone will agree that we all love a good 38 genera synonymy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we'll open the floor to our questions. Uh, so I'll uh, start with one for you there, Lauren. Um, I may have missed mm -hmm. it in your tree, but were you able to sample um, any of the um, genera occurring in the uh, islands nearby to Australia in like Fiji and New Caledonia? And if you were, mm. did they um, place where you expected kind of diverging from the Australian mainland or coming kind of down from um, Papua New Guinea? Yeah, so unfortunately that is a gap in our sampling. Um, we have mostly Australian mainland species, a few from um, Norfolk Island, which I sort of grouped with New Zealand just for sort of geographic convenience, even though it's technically Australia, um, and some New Zealand, but yeah, we didn't get anything from Melanesia. So that would have helped us when looking at the New Zealand clade, because most of our New Zealand taxa were in one group. So it looks like it was sort of one dispersal event that they were sort of colonized after the breakup of Gondwana. But we can't tell if that was sort of directly across the Tasman from Australia or if they sort of island hopped from Melanesia down that way. So yeah, in the future, if we can get some samples from Solomons in New Caledonia, that would shed some light on that here. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, well, it looks like we don't have any other questions and we're uh, at time. Uh, so I'd like to um, invite everyone to thank our speakers for this afternoon session. And um, next up, we actually have a panel discussion. So if um, I can ask the speakers to stick around just for a little bit more, if there's any other questions or uh, discussion points we would like to go through, please uh, throw it in the chat or raise your hand and I'll call you in. Uh, oh. Something's just popped in from Jeff, uh, which is, are uh, any of the flightless uh, Gondwanan species of longicorns restricted to higher altitudes? That will be one for you, Lauren. Yeah, that is an excellent question. I actually have no idea. Um, I think for the, certainly the flightless species in Australia, I don't think any of them are sort of altitude specialists. I think there's one genus that's only found in Tasmania. So that probably, I imagine that would be sort of an, an altitude specialist, but definitely there are some that we can find right along the East Coast that are, yeah, like we collected them from um, New England National Park, which is 
not that high elevated. So, but yeah, the New Zealand ones, I'm, I'm not really sure what their habitat is like here. Um, just to add to that, I'm, uh, I'm not very familiar with the flightless species. Can you shed a little bit more light on their biology and their dispersal? Because I'm assuming uh, longicorns wouldn't be very good at dispersing just on by foot. Yeah, yeah. So um, the flightless ones tend to be um, just the elytra are fused together. So you, there's, they can't open them up anymore. And they're, and they're all sort of really like fat and cute. <laughs> um, like I think I had one in my, one of my slides that is just a very round body shape, which is quite unusual for the other longhorns. They're usually quite skinny. Um, but yeah, usually these things, the adults don't last very long. So I imagine that they would just be walking around on the ground trying to find a mate within the closest distance. So they probably don't disperse very far at all. Thanks, Lauren. But yeah, I don't think anyone's really looked at that. Like we just sort of found some on the ground on a field trip and we're like, hey, we just came in the right place at the right time and they were all over the, were all over the track. So we just picked lots of them up. 